In the name of Jesus. Tonight we begin the Lenten sermon series on the Psalms. Tonight, Psalm 38. But especially these words of verse 22, Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, the 38th Psalm is the Psalm that you and I chanted together back and forth earlier. It was a Psalm that presented many things, but one of the things that became very clear is that it pre presented the picture of a man who had been deeply wounded, someone who was sincerely crushed, and especially by his own sinfulness. King David wrote the psalm. And as it goes, David's problems only got worse as the psalm went on. I suppose it's that way for us too. His friends abandoned him. His enemies use David's weakness to try and destroy him. And after all the goings on in the midst of this psalm, David cries out in the very last stanza, Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. What a true, true picture of life under sin our psalm gives to us this evening. Sometimes with sin, it seems to want to stick out like a festering sore that everybody can see, the whole world can see it, but it seems there's one for sure that can't see it, and that's yourself. So often pride gets in our way. Pride won't let us see the plank sticking out of our own eye like the Apostle Peter, who could not see that his pride led him to a great fall by denying Christ to the entire world. In the same way, you and I are spiritually blind and we're incapable of ourselves of seeing our sin for what it truly is. God must have his way with you. And the way that he has his way with you is through the law and the gospel. David in our psalm has God's law. Very, very heavy upon him. We might say that the arrows of God's law have pierced him clean through. The law has awakened him in the knowledge of his own sinfulness. Even as St. Paul writes, that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. David in our psalm finally sees how his sin has indeed destroyed his life. His health is gone. His friends are gone. His enemies are standing at the gate for him. Yet at the bottom of all of this is the reality of sin for David, but also the forgiveness of sins. It was St. Augustine who once said regarding this psalm, But happy is he who is wretched after this manner. And Augustine actually echoed the words of Jesus who said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In Psalm 38, David mourns, he laments his sin. He recognizes the depth of his sinfulness. He recognizes the harm that his sinful nature does to him. And he recognizes its hurt not only in his body, but also in his soul. So I suppose the question this night for you and me is this. Do you, like David, 
recognize your sinfulness too? Do you see yourself in this psalm? In other words, has God's law had its way with you in your heart so that you also, like David, mourn your sinfulness and fear God's just wrath? It seems that we today live in an age where really nobody is responsible for anything. There's always somebody else to blame besides ourselves. Someone will say, well, it's not my fault, it's my parents' fault. Someone will say, well, it's not my fault, that's just the way I was raised. Well, it's just in my genes, you know. Whatever. But God's law will not let you or me pass the buck so easily. As David says, I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. Confession is saying the same thing about yourself that God says about you. God says that we, apart from Christ, are totally sinners. Notice in this psalm that David never tries to pass the blame. He never points to someone else. These troubles of body and spirit, they weigh heavily on David because he realizes that it's his sin. Not somebody else's sin. You and I have a beautiful thing in Luther's small catechism. There, we are told about the office of the keys. That office established by Christ. John chapter 20. Jesus said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. But if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And then we ask the question, well, what do you believe according to these words of Jesus in John chapter 20? To which we rightly say, I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command in particular... When they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. Notice the two sides of the coin. Because God's word has two ways about it. It has the law and it has the gospel. And therefore, the called ministers of Christ must deal with God's flock by the law and the gospel. With the law, God himself does the crushing. And with the gospel, God himself builds us up and makes us alive. Through the lens of the law, when you read this psalm, you hear of yourself as one who is crushed, one who is broken, one who is alone, one who is forsaken, and one who has been cast away from your God. Through the lens of the law, you only have the crying voice of the beggar to say, Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. But look at this psalm also through another light. Look at it through the eyes of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at this through the eyes of the gospel. It was the prophet Isaiah who said that the suffering servant was wounded 
for your transgressions. That Paul also wrote, For our sake God made him to be sin who, know, who knew no sin for you. And it was Christ who cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, this same Jesus is the Jesus who shed tears of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he also prays this psalm, Psalm 38, for you. So look at this psalm again in light of individual confession and absolution. Remembering what Jesus gave up for you. He took your sin upon himself. So therefore, he groans. He suffers. He bleeds. He has no health in his body. He is abandoned by his friends. He is betrayed by his disciples. His enemies rise up around him. His back is filled with searing pain. His strength fails. The light in his eyes dim. You see, in light of Jesus, we see the one who had no sin bearing our sin for us. And we see it most clearly expressed in his cross. You see, that's the gift of holy absolution, the gift of forgiveness. To see it in light of Christ for you and for your salvation. So that when you come to your pastor, confess your sins, all of Christ's work on the cross comes for you. And you hear it in the sweetest, sweetest words of gospel when the pastor declares to you and for you in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, you still suffer the earthly consequences of sin. While yet fully a saint, you still know the pain of sin. And you still know the hurt of sin. It's true that you still have aches and pains. And even worse, there are real and true consequences for our sins in this life. But remember that ultimately and eternally, these consequences really have no eternal teeth to them. Ultimately, they can't really harm you. Why? Because you are in Christ. And his words of forgiveness release you from your debt. Those words of forgiveness were bought with a terrible, terrible price. The death of God's Son upon a cross but God yet still gives his forgiveness to you freely, and he does it with great joy. While Peter denied our Lord three times, he claims you as his own every single time. And in Christ, you will never, ever, ever be abandoned. Because you are his. So pray it with David this Lenten season. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Pray it in faith. Pray it in repentant joy. Knowing that God comes to you. And he comes with the forgiveness of sins. In the name of Jesus. Amen.